patient and prayerful crowd waits in St. Peter's Square as the Cardinals of the Catholic Church in solemn conclave cast their fifth ballot for a successor to Pope John. Then, puffs of white smoke from a stove in the Sistine Chapel. A Pope has been elected. The burning ballots signal the joyous news. When the word spread through Rome like wildfire, St. Peter's Square was filled with cheering crowds within moments. There's rejoicing throughout the world. Inside the Sistine Chapel, one seat is vacant, the one that was occupied by Giovanni Battista Cardinal Montini. He now reigns as the 261st successor to St. Peter. In papal robes, the new pontiff announces he will take the name of Paul VI. Obviously. If Cardinal Siri was elected Pope at the 1958 Conclave, he would have remained the true Pope until his death in 1989, unless he went through a very formal and public resignation of his office. Therefore, any Conclave following his 1958 election would be unlawful, and anyone else claiming to be the Pope would be an imposter. Regardless, the 1963 Conclave took place, and a new man was pronounced Pope, However, Father Malachi Martin again testifies in his book, The Keys of This Blood, that Cardinal Siri was nominated and elected again in 1963, but was forced aside by what has been called the Little Brutality. He was close to his predecessor, Pope John, and is quick to announce that he will continue that pontiff's progressive policies. The new Pope's first public appearance is to impart the blessing Orbi et Orbi to the city and to the world. The new pontiff was the first cardinal created by Pope John, and as Pope Paul, he is going to continue the ecumenical council. Thus, the new spiritual leader of a half billion Catholics pledges to make his church a dynamic force in the manner of Pope John XXIII. Before moving on to the section on Pope Paul VI, let us reflect briefly on the success of these progressive policies while comparing the church in 1963 to what it's become. Since Vatican II, it is estimated that 100,000 priests have left the priesthood. In 1965, over 1,575 new priests were ordained in the United States. In 2002, the number was 450. Between 1965 and 2002, the number of seminarians dropped from 49,000 to 4,700, a decline of over 90% and two-thirds of the 600 seminaries that were operating in 1965 have now closed. In 1965, there were 180,000 Catholic nuns. By 2002, that had fallen to 75,000. In 1965, there were 104,000 teaching nuns. Today, there are only 8,200, a decline of 94%. Almost half of all Catholic high schools in the United States have closed since 1965. The annual number of marriage annulments rose from 338 in 1968 to 50,000 in 2002. Only 10% of lay religious teachers now accept church teaching on contraception. 53% believe a Catholic can have an abortion and remain a good Catholic. 65% believe that Catholics may divorce and remarry. 77% believe that one can be a good Catholic without going to Mass on Sundays. By one New York Times poll, 70% of all Catholics in the age group 18 to 44 believe the Eucharist is merely a symbolic reminder of Jesus. In 1963, abortion was illegal, motion pictures were wholesome, pornography was rare, and homosexuality was nearly unheard of. Are these not the social ills that the church is meant to guard against? How is it that we have lost every battle since 1963? How is it that every measurable indicator shows the church is in rapid disintegration? Indeed, if the progressive policies of John the 23rd and Paul the 6th were meant to strengthen and expand the Roman Catholic faith, their failure is beyond comprehension. However, it is far more likely that these reforms were a resounding success, and they did exactly what they were intended to do. 
destroy the Holy Roman Catholic Church.